Well, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for coming today. At least the sun is out today. We're happy about that. Um, and welcome to the Project Green's uh, third and final out. garden forum for 2019. Uh, please take a moment to silence your cell phones if you haven't already done that. Uh, my name is Connie Gabe. Uh, we hope our forums educate and inspire you to garden and to appreciate the beautiful gardens and green spaces in Iowa City. We're always welcoming new volunteers and we've always got a sign up sheet at the front desk, so please, please join us if you'd be interested. I'd like to thank our partner, the Iowa City Public Library, Beth Fisher and her crew for hosting our forums year after year. Um, this program can be viewed on Library Channel 20 and is available for checkout as well. And I understand it's going to be live streamed on YouTube today or something too. So anyway, we're going up, up upscale here. Um, our door prizes today are donated by Project Green and Project Green longtime volunteer Mac Molston, and we thank him and them for that. Um, throughout the years, our nonprofit organization has funded over two million in projects, including public gardens at the city-owned Ned Ashton House on Park Road and Terry Trueblood Recreational Area. Our all-volunteer effort has grown to include planning and maintaining parks, roadsides, riverfronts, medians, parkways, and public school grounds. In 2019, we celebrate 51 years of service to the community. Um, as always, your financial contributions are greatly appreciated and may be made online at the Project Green website, the Community Foundation of Johnson County, or via the City of Iowa City. Um, we're excited to share some upcoming events with you, and they've been mentioned in the previous forums. Um, we're trying a new kind of um, garden tour this year. Um, it's called Open Garden Weekends, and we have information at the front desk. Um, it includes free admission to a wide selection of Iowa City gardens, and we are looking for volunteers, people to uh, show their gardens. Um, it's whether it's just a you know a tiny plant-filled patio or an impressively landscaped garden, uh, formal or quirky, flowers or vegetables. We'd love to have you on a tour. So think about that, and keep your uh, calendars open for the weekend of July 13th and 14th. Uh, 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. is when that's scheduled for this year. Uh, and then also in 2019, in lieu of our annual plant sale, we plan to have a booth at the Iowa City Farmer's Market. And that's beginning May 4th, which I think is the first farmer's market that's scheduled for the year. Um, check our website later this spring for more information on both the Open Gardens Weekend and the Farmer's Market. There's also a poster up there for a bus trip in June um, that uh, you might want to look at. Um, I think it's up to Seed Savers and Decora, and I understand there are about 20 places left on the bus ride if anybody's interested in that. Um, so on with the program. We're excited to have uh, Mark Vitash here with us this week. Um, I'm particularly excited because Mark is the first speaker we've had this year that's actually been able to make it. We've had substitutes. <laughs> so I guess March is, March is a good time to come. Um, Mark is a district forester in the Iowa DNR Wildlife Bureau, and he is a popular garden forum presenter and a public radio star with his frequent guest appearances on IPR's Hort Friday. Uh, Mark is speaking on the current state of tree health in Iowa and will provide updates on the spread and treatment for emerald ash borer and other threats to our landscape trees. He'll provide information and examples of desirable trees that are beautiful, hardy, and add diversity to our landscapes. Mark is originally from Iowa City and has a BS and an MS in forestry from Iowa State University. He's been a professional forester since 1988, both in Oklahoma and Iowa, and a district forester for the DNR for the last 20 years. He assists private landowners in seven counties in managing their forest resources. He loves to hunt mushrooms uh, in the spring, and uh, maybe he can give us some tips on that. <laughs> some maps, too. I find them that way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, Mark will present for the first hour, then we'll have a short break, about 20 minute break, for coffee and refreshments. And then um, after that, we'll have 30, 40 minutes of questions for Mark. And there is a clipboard 
um, on the table there if uh, to write down your questions if if you'd like if you have some questions to ask so now um, please join me in welcoming Mark Vitash <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I was here, the last time I was here was in 2008 in the City High Girls won the state championship. I remember that because my daughter was on the team. And, uh, but City High has done very well many years after that. They haven't won a state championship, but they, they've done well. Um, also, I've done this an, a number of times, and one time I did it in 1998 after the uh, big windstorm we had in 98. We did one on storm damage and stuff. But I did it with a colleague at the time. His name was Dr. Paul Ray. And I want to do this for him today because he passed away two weeks ago. And he was a big mentor of mine. He had some tough health battles in the last two years. But uh, he, he'll be remembered. Um, he was a great, great person. And he's taught me a lot. So today my talk is in honor of him. But, so I'm supposed to talk, and Beth, if you can hear me, you said you were going to knock the lights down a little bit, maybe. See if she can do it from in there. If not, she'll come in. There you go. Thanks. That's good. Uh, not quite that dark. <laughs> Sound like the, that one commercial. Um, but uh, anyway, <laughs> okay, come on now, Beth. One or the other, right? Yeah, one of the, there, right there. We're good. All right. We're doing this show later too, right? Okay. Um, so on this topic, tree health challenges and, and future. So I have to tell you a quick story. At night, a lot of times my wife will shake me because she says I'm screaming and waving and yelling. And she says, when she wakes me up, she'll go, what bug was chasing you this time? I have nightmares about diseases and insects all the time. Um, the more I thought about this presentation and the more I did, worked on it, I've worked on it off and on over the last month, sitting at the table or whatever at home, and um, I got pretty depressed. There's a lot of challenges. But my message to you today is diversity, diversity, diversity. And I want to kind of tell some stories related to that. Um, I, I don't think we've learned our lessons, and I'll talk about those lessons. And, and go through that with you. But before that, I, I want to go just talk about trees and forests in general a little bit, be a little more positive before I talk about some of the negatives and some of the challenges. But, whoops, here we go. But trees start very mighty and very small. There's a lot of challenges. Think about the mighty squirrel, the deer that want to eat these nutritionist things. There are acorn weevils that also like to eat these things. And the challenges that these things have to go through to grow. And as they start, think of all the challenges. That just says, do you want to eat me? I mean, a deer, a rabbit. I mean, it just says, yum, yum, yum. So the challenges that these things go through. And if you think about historically, those challenges were fire. A lot of fire ran through our forest historically before settlers came. So there's always a lot of challenges. But through all those challenges, sometimes those trees become mighty. But those trees are 150 years old, 200 years old, 250 years old. Think what these trees know. It's, 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 it's just fascinating. Trees have also learned to work together, to share space. But they don't have to have everything, OK? They also help each other, support each other. That is a catalpa growing 30 feet off the ground in a silver maple tree. Wow. So the silver maple's helping the catalpa. I don't know how long it's going to last up there, 30 feet off the ground, but it's supporting. And because trees support, they're always there just in case you need help. They really try to hang on to everything the best they can. But they also support and shelter those that might need help. There's nothing there today, but you know a lot of critters live underneath. That is the root system of this tree. 
just below the ground surface. Trees keep their young close. There's mama. Here's all the babies. Keeps the family close. And there's always a light at the end of the tunnel. And they remember their history. Trees don't forget. But even in their death, they support others. And even when their foundation is hit hard, they do all they can to stay sturdy. And when life is tough and things are pushing against them, they still try to keep their balance in their lives. And trees bring people together in many different ways. Just a few other pictures. I get a call on this every year. People will send me this picture and say, what kind of flower is this in my forest? This is actually a young shagbark hickory leaf coming out of the bud scales. And it looks like a flower, but these are actually the bud scales. But it's pretty in its own way. But these are areas that I get to walk in my job as a district forester. Most people don't know that these are places in Iowa, but there's some pretty neat places. Actually, this one is on the grounds of ACT here in Iowa City. Some really neat sycamores off of Scott Boulevard. And we always talk about Iowa is where the forest meets the prairie. Okay. So I wanted to start positive before I got somewhat negative <laughs> or talked about challenges. So what are some of the tree challenges that we're facing with trees? And you know, the, the big question I always ask is, is, have we learned from the past? I don't really think we have. So we all know about Dutch elm disease. Um, how many people know about Dutch elm disease? OK, everybody in the room. <laughs> All right, so historically, it was first found in the US in the 1930s. It was introduced um, in the US. It was first found in Iowa around 1956, and this is according to Iowa State in one of their publications. And I believe one of the counties was Scott County is where it was first found. And, and we all know about the tragedy and, and the devastation that Dutch elm disease caused in, in Iowa. So basically, between the 1960s and the 1980s, um, it, it really hit the population hard. And according to the ISU publication, 95% of our urban American elms were most likely killed in those time periods. So here's the, the, the good news, though. You know, it, it's been since the 30s, we are starting to plant American elms again. There are some disease tolerant, they say disease resistant, I tend to call them disease tolerant. And you, there's a publication when you leave today, and I, with this group, I'm, there's enough over there, but there's a publication from the DNR, um, the title of it, and you'll get this in a minute, is called Rethinking Maple, Selecting Trees for Your Yard. But in there, it talks about some of the varieties of American elm that are being reintroduced. That doesn't mean that we're gonna go back and line our streets again with American elms. But it could be a species that we could consider selecting again uh, in some situations. The other thing is, as a mushroom hunter, there are elms everywhere. I walk the woods all the time. The, the neat thing about elm is it produces a lot of seed. So they'll get about this big before they get Dutch elm disease often. In that time, they can produce a lot of seed. So when I walk in the woods, there's little seedlings coming all over the place. And I still walk the woods and find American elms that big, scattered here and there. You can go into Iowa City, there are still scattered American elms. Now over the last couple years, some of those elms have succumbed to Dutch elm disease. One example is there's, there was a beautiful elm on the campus at uh, City High. It, I think they finally removed it, but over the last two years, it looked like it got Dutch elm disease. But they never treated it. They never did anything with it. It did fine, but then it just succumbed. The other thing I'm seeing in the woods is, as a mushroom hunter, you like dead elms. I have to be honest, OK? There's often a connection. Not always, but often. But what's happened the last couple years is I'll walk the woods in the spring, and I'm always looking up 
for dead tops. And that's, and when I see a dead elm and I see the structure, my heart starts thumping and uh, my clippers are ready to start slicing and I'm ready to get in there. But what's happened the last couple of years, I get up there, I start looking and then I look up. The top is completely dead, but there's little sprouts all over the trunk of the tree. It's still alive. Normally in Dutch elm disease, the trees die within six to eight weeks. But the last couple of years I've noticed for some reason, um, trees are taking maybe two or three years to die. That may be a good thing. That may mean that there's some genetic uh, vulnerability to the fungus. Things aren't as vibrant as they were. Maybe trees are showing some tolerance. So that could be some good signs. But there's, there's still a lot of elms out there trying. So what did we do next? Well, in the DNR, we did a little study over the last couple years, basically from 2008 to 2015. And I was involved in some of these in different parts in eastern Iowa. And we got these little Trimble units, which are GPS units. And we actually would go up. And we went into communities that were between 500 and 5,000 population. We didn't work with some of the bigger communities because often they have some budgets and, and they can do some things to inventory their own, own trees. So we got a grant to work with a lot of smaller communities. And we went through these smaller communities and we inventoried all the public trees, basically between the street and the sidewalk and in the parks. And I really like these inventories because it's the only time in my job where I get to wear shorts. <laughs> Usually I'm walking through brush and stuff like that and shorts don't work very well. So I don't mind doing a few inventories. But we did complete inventories of those trees. So we looked at their species, their condition, their size, if they were a potential risk, to try to get as much information to those communities. And the reason we really did it starting in 2008 is we were trying to prepare them for emerald ash borer. So we were trying to tell them how many ash trees they had, how many other species they had, so they could really start to prepare for potential problems. So what did we find? Um, basically what we found is 17% of the public trees in those communities were ash, but 37% were maple. And most of that ash was either green ash or white ash. And the maple was sugar maple, silver maple, Norway maple, red maple, hybrid maple. There was a lot of maples. Um, but then you also see oak, uh, apple, crab apple. I would say the majority of those were crab apples and not apples. And you can see the list. That generally is what we, what we found. So what does that tell you? What did we do, do as a society in Iowa? We lost all of our elms. So we planted maple and ash. So there could be other problems. Well, as we all know, there is a problem. It's called the emerald ash borer. And uh, it really likes ash trees, it likes them a lot. And this was the first find in Johnson County uh, near the University of Iowa Library. And one of the publications from Iowa City says 2014, but I think the actual find of this was in 2016, okay? So that's when we first found it in Iowa City or in Johnson County. And a year or two before that, it was found just north of Johnson County along I-380 um, along the rest area, just south of Cedar Rapids. I'm going to have to get a little closer here. But it was first found in Iowa in Almakee County in 2010. Okay, and between 2010 and 2017, all the yellow spots showed up over those years being infested. But it was found up here in Almakee County first, but the next find was clear down here. So they didn't fly down here, and they didn't come from here. They most likely came from across the river in Illinois. The ash borer tends to only fly maybe a mile to a couple miles tops, depending on what research you look at and what research you see. The majority of them move through firewood movement and wood material, stuff like that. The other thing is during that time, there's a highway, Highway 34, I think, that comes along the south. There's also a rail there. There was a lot of 
a lot of these communities popped up fairly quickly. And the other thing to remember is with all of these, in most cases, that insect was there for five years before they found it. So this insect attacks, but it takes it probably four to five years to get a population big enough before it starts killing trees. And we don't have a good trap or anything to trap them like we do with gypsy moth and some of the other insects. So we were pretty much to the point that we had to wait till trees started showing symptoms, which was basically dying from the top down before we could find these outbreaks. So it, that comes to the story that, you know, out here, it doesn't show it yet. And in Jones County, it doesn't show it. But I'm not a betting man, but if I was, I would say it's in Jones County and we just haven't found it yet. And it's probably out here in a number of these counties and it just hasn't been found yet. So it's just going to be a matter of time. Um, and there's already been a new find in 2019 uh, out west. So it won't be long before emerald ash borers is all the way across the state. So here's another important thing, though, to think about. Um, this is a, it, it's actually called the uh, curve of death is what the scientists call it. And, and this is for emerald ash borer and for ash trees. And what they found is when it's first found, there's very little mortality here, okay? But then within about five years, that mortality really starts to increase because that population starts getting big enough where they can really start being aggressive and really starting to kill trees. If you don't know how emerald ash borer kills trees, it's a larva that feeds just underneath the bark. And that's where the plumbing system of the trees are. So they actually feed just underneath that surface and they basically cut off the plumbing system and eventually there's no food and water. And when we get heavily infested trees, you almost just pull the bark off. There's been that many bores that you can just see them all the way throughout. And that's how it kills. But it takes a while. So if we found it in 2016 in Iowa City, we're right in here somewhere. So within the next five years, and it's already starting to step up a little bit in the northern part of Iowa City, we're going to continue to see tree death. And when we really start to see it, it really, really goes fast. And in urban areas, that's a big concern because ash in general tends to be pretty brittle. And what's happening, it was first found in the Detroit area in Michigan. And out there, when they got to this period, they were losing three, four, five, six hundred trees a year in their communities and trying to keep up with that removal for safety purposes and stuff because those trees become brittle and risky was pretty difficult to do. That's why you see cities like Cedar Rapids. One of the methods that they chose was they've gone, they went to a preventive mode a number of years ago. They started removing healthy ash trees. They treated a few, but they actually, and we'll talk about treatment options and stuff like that just a little bit, but they actually were removing three or 400 a year because they knew that they couldn't remove six to 700 to 1,000 a year budget-wise, okay? So in Iowa and actually in different parts of the United States, they are starting to do some biological control though, to try to impact the population. It's not gonna control the population, but they've released some critters. Does that make you? <laughs> they have, and those critters are not from here. So that's always a concern. So there's three parasitic wasps that have been introduced into public areas since 2016 in these counties in Iowa, okay? And the evaluation of those releases will start in 2019. So this summer, I think, they'll actually go back to those areas and see if those parasites are actually starting to kill the larva or the eggs. Some, a couple of them are larva parasites, and, and one, I think, one or two is an egg parasite. So they'll have to evaluate to see if what they've done has actually worked. Um, but early results from other states have shown that they might be starting to establish in some of those areas. But usually the population of those natural controls or those natural predators lags way behind the population 
of the actual insect that they're attacking. So it takes them a while to catch up. But they're also saying that even at its maximum, probably only about 40% control of the population. And the one thing I'll tell you, so you don't have to write this question down, as far as we know in Iowa, it did not get cold enough to kill the Elmer and Ash for. <laughs> so they're probably still going to be around, all right? As you get further north, minus 30 was kind of, in some of the research, was kind of the threshold. But it was minus 30, not wind chill, just minus 30. And um, it was for multiple, like multiple weeks, and not multiple days. So there may be a little bit of loss because of that but probably not. The one concern, and I haven't seen anything in the literature, I worry a little bit about these parasites, how well they'll do in some of these cold temperatures. And, and that's what the evaluations will tell us. These things will not sting you, though. They're, these are very tiny. You will not see them. Their gnat size are smaller. They're very tiny parasites. Um, and again, you're going to ask, do they attack anything else? Well. Because of some of the lessons we've learned from other things we've released, over, well, I say we, not me, but society, um, there's this little ladybug that we all like to see in the fall that was released a number of years ago out west to be a biological control of aphids, and we know how that went. But they, they have some pretty heavy evaluation systems that they go through with these critters now before they do releases to try to eliminate potential problems that, that might be caused. And the thing to remember, this, the emerald ash borer came from Asia, and over there it's not a problem. It's more of a secondary issue because they have natural controls that keep that population under control. So if you had a tree in your yard and it was still alive, what would you do or what could you do? So I have a couple of options. You could do nothing and remove the ash tree as they begin to die and then replace it. That's just an option, okay? I have an ash tree in my yard, and it was planted in 1963, 1964. It's a huge tree, beautiful tree, but it's already showing decline symptoms. So I have chosen not to treat it because even if I treat it, it's probably going to die on its own in the next five years. So I've chosen not. I actually um, chose the sec second option. I had a little room to one side and I planted a, an oak tree in an open space. And then as this ash gets closer to death, I'm going to remove it. And it's actually, the ash trees lasted longer than I thought because my oak tree is already starting to do this. So, but even folks like me with the background I have, and I talk about diversity, and I was thinking diversity when I picked it, but I picked a bur oak, great tree. But I'm going to talk to you later today when I talk about plants to avoid. I'm going to tell you to avoid planting bur oak because of a new disease that we're seeing on bur oaks. But the sun will come up tomorrow. That will be my last slide, I promise. Okay. So other options. I'm trying to be positive. Um, so we can treat healthy ash trees with an insecticide or different insecticides. But that's going to be a long-term commitment. And some of the results that they're getting in Michigan and Ohio and Chicago have been pretty positive. Okay, So there are some things out there. I'm not going to spend a ton of time talking about insecticides. I know that's a big issue and everything, but I just give you the options. Another one is to remove ash now and just start over. Okay, But you notice I use the word diversity in there multiple times. I know sometimes you may, you may have a yard, though it's just one tree. And you don't have options for diversity in the sense of you can't plant five different trees. But if you can, this is a great opportunity to reintroduce more diversity. Another option would be, if you had room, is to get a tree started. You could still treat your tree if you wanted to. And then as your new tree got fairly established, you could stop treating your tree and let it go. So there, there are multiple options. The best option is what works best for you. So the real critical thing, though, is if you are going to treat trees, that it has to be a healthy tree, a safe tree. And so a lot of times I'll look at trees, and I just don't think they're a good candidate for treatment, like the tree in my yard, for many different reasons. I could treat it, 
but it's going to die for other purposes. Or I've looked at trees and they have poor form or poor structure. They're already at risk and that tree shouldn't even be in the landscape in the first place. Or that tree, and this basically for me, the, the life expectancy of an ash in urban communities is between 40 and 70 years. I've been doing this for almost 30 years and I see a lot of ash removed and they're usually less than 70 years old and they decline from other things. So you have to keep that in perspective too. If you have a tree that's, you know, 60, 70, 80 years old, now that doesn't mean you can't have a 100 year old ash. That doesn't mean you're not gonna have an ash that could live long. If you have an ash that's healthy, it's in the right situation and treatment might be an option for you. There's a good publication from Iowa State that talks specifically about chemicals, timing, those kind of things. That'll be real critical, okay. So enough on that. The other thing we found was, again, looking back at, at the situation of the inventory in Iowa, we had all this, all this maple, all right? Well, we love to plant maple. And a lot of, we like to plant this autumn blaze and other varieties that grow fast, have great fall color. But there's a new insect knocking on the door. It's called the Asian longhorn beetle, okay? It is not in Iowa yet, okay? It's not in Iowa, but it's in Ohio. It's in Massachusetts. I believe it's in Pennsylvania. This one, though, was found in the Chicago area, I think about 10 years ago, and they actually were able, they found it early, and they were able to eradicate it. Um, but they ended up cutting down about 3,000 trees in a zone to eradicate it. In parts of Ohio, they've already removed like 30,000 trees in some of these areas because the population of the pest was bigger than they thought. Well, one of its favorite foods is maple. So again, I don't think we've learned our lesson. Again, diversity, diversity, diversity. Um, and diversity isn't five or four different kinds of maple or four or five different kinds of oak. It's different species and actually even different genera. Uh, when, when I first started college and studying kind of urban forestry and different things, um, they used to say in general in a community population, you want your no more than 20% of any genus, okay? And no more than 10% of a species. Most have gone down to basically 10% of any genus. And there's a gentleman out of South Dakota, he actually thinks we should not go more than 5% of any genus. So that means we really need to mix things up. The thing you gotta remember, a lot of these diseases and insects are specific to a particular tree or tree species. Now, there are some exceptions. I'll talk about gypsy moth in a minute. It has over 300 hosts, okay? Japanese beetle, which doesn't kill trees but makes them look ugly, it has like 300 hosts. But a lot of the insects and diseases are usually more specific to particular species, okay? So keep that in mind. So for Iowa City, just to give you an idea, they recently did a survey and we had 20% maple and 8% ash, and that ash has actually dropped. It was originally at about 3,000 trees, and this is out of 45,000 public trees that they did an inventory on, but there were 66 genera represented in 178 different species of trees represented in that study. That's some pretty decent diversity, but we're pretty heavy on the top here with a few species, okay? And we're starting to see that impact with ash. But potentially, we've got that maple there. And so a lot of times when I work with communities, at least communities, when I was working with the smaller communities, if they had more than 10% maple, we were telling them to not plant any more maple, at least in their public areas, to try to reduce that and uh, try to get more diversity. So I mentioned the oak was 8%. And this is gypsy moth. It, it uh, started in the US in the late 1800s. It was introduced. Um, the interesting thing about this, the female moth does not fly. She lays eggs on things, like little, little trees and nurseries, 
on campers, on firewood, things that move. And she can't fly, but her egg masses can travel across the country. And, and that's how it's been moving across the country. It's mostly in the east, but it's moving west. And for the first time in Iowa, in 2017, we actually found egg masses in Iowa. This is, was over in, I want to say, Jackson County, near up around Bellevue is where they found these. And the fact that we found egg masses most likely means that the insect, the entire life cycle is starting to get established in Iowa. Gypsy moth has 300 different hosts, and one of its favorite foods is oak. But it won't kill them right out. That's the good thing. Um, it defoliates. The larva actually defoliates the tree. And then um, if that happens year after year, those trees can start to become stressed. I think we have a small advantage. And this is just a theory. And I'm sure some of my colleagues will tell me I'm completely wrong. But I, but I think agriculture is actually going to be to our benefit with this. We, we criticize the fragmentation because of agriculture, because it's broken up our forests and stuff, especially for neotropical birds. It's not just agriculture. It's, it's our urban areas and everything that we do in development. It's not just agriculture. But um, we criticize that. But at the same time, since this critter does not fly, and you have a forest, and then you have corn and beans, it's going to be harder for them to get to the next forest. In some cases in Iowa, it may be six miles before the next forest. That may be a good thing because when the little larvae hatch out, they silk out and the wind picks them up. And up in Wisconsin and Michigan, where there's continuous forest, they just keep moving through the forest that way. But if they land on a corn plant, they're going to go icky, icky. <laughs> I'm hoping they'll eat it because if they do, you know they'll get killed very quickly. It's just my theory. Um, but uh, they won't be a problem if they start eating corn and beans, <laughs> trust me. Uh, but again, just another one of those concerns. I don't think that's a reason not to plant oak, but it's something to consider that is going to have an impact. And in campgrounds and areas when this population starts to get heavy, uh, they eat so aggressively. They go to the bathroom aggressively, too. They actually close down campgrounds because it rains fecal matter. It gets pretty ugly, OK? It gets pretty ugly. So just another one that, that's on our radar that initially could have, eventually could have some impacts. All right. There's a few more bad things coming, but not a lot. Again, the sun came up. So if we're going to think about planting trees, what are some of the things that we want to think about? And, and I've done parts of this presentation before, but I, I think it's really critical. What, the, the thing I don't want you to do when you call me and say, Mark, I want to plant this type of tree in my yard. Because what I'm going to ask you is all this stuff. I'm going to ask you what your soil conditions are like. How much sun do you have? How much space do you have? Where are the location and the utilities? All these kinds of things. The thing that I want you to do is look at your site first and then figure out what fits in that site the best. And I've learned over time that if you do that, you're going to have a much better chance to have a successful situation with getting those trees established if you pick the right tree for the right place. Um, but once you evaluate the site, drainage, soil, maybe even pH, location of utilities, underground and above, then you start looking at like the list I have. Iowa State has some great lists. But start looking at those trees. We have some great arboretums in, in Iowa. You can um, Clinton Arboretum, Bickelhoff Arboretum in Clinton, Dubuque, uh, Ryman Gardens in Ames, the, the Iowa Arboretum. Um, the Brenton Arboretum near Des Moines. There's a, a, a developing arboretum up on the Blackhawk Community College campus. I mean, they're kind of everywhere. But what I tell folks is if you start looking at trees that you might pick, look at them and say, is that something that's going to fit? Is that something that, you know, don't forget, you plant them this big, but they get large. They grow. Think about what they're going to look like. But also think about, do you want, what are you doing it for? Are you doing it for shade, wildlife habitat, um, just general beauty? 
whatever, and, and make sure that that plant fits. Because the funniest thing that happens, people call and six years after they got a tree, and you go, yeah, Mark, that tree grows well, but it's just dirty. It's just a dirty tree. Well, look at it before you buy it and figure out if you think it's a dirty tree or not. Again, I always tell them when they call, I say, you know, I know a lot of people are messy and we put up with them, so <laughs> it's a, just a tree. Okay, it's still giving us a lot of benefits. But again, think about what the mature size of that tree and make sure it's gonna fit. And years ago, I would have never said this, but I, I think in most cases, there's a plant that's gonna fit in your situation. But it may not be a big tree. It may be a dwarf conifer. But there are plants that will fit in those situations depending on what. I think sometimes we force things in too much. And then if, if you can plant more than one, as much diversity that you can plant, the better. So this is our goal. When we plant a new tree, we want it to, to do well, get well established, and, and benefit. But I was I actually had this in a presentation yesterday in Muscatine, not this entire presentation, but this picture. This tree probably is too big for that situation, but it's a beautiful tree. It's actually a red oak, it's just a, just a beautiful. There's two in my neighborhood and my wife won't let me move in that house, so um, it hasn't been for sale. Well, actually it is for sale. That was last year though. Um, but this may be a situation where, I mean, this tree wants to get 30 more feet tall and it wants to spread out. I mean, it's going to be a monster. It's going to be awesome, but pretty big for that situation. So again, think about the space. We're trying to avoid this. A lot of problems I see 10, 20 years could have been prevented with proper selection, proper planning. I don't have time to talk about planning today, but we can avoid some of these things and some of these issues. Um, and I actually in this one, I know it was related to planning. They ended up planting it too deep and it got what we call stem girling roots, roots starting to grow. It, it wasn't prepared correctly, and it, but it started to have problems 10 years after they planted the tree, okay? So that's what we're trying to avoid. And we're also trying to avoid this. Help, my white pine is eating my house, what do I do? <laughs> this would be a great spot for a dwarf conifer. There are little evergreens, if you really wanted an evergreen as People like using blue spruce as this foundation tree too. This tree wants to get 70 feet tall. It's not the right tree for that spot, okay? Usually folks will call me and say, is it okay if I just cut the top of it out, Mark? <laughs> and then just hedge right here? Okay, we can avoid those issues. So I do have some concerns of a few trees though before I talk about a few trees that we could consider planting. I, I do have some concerns about some that we've planted a lot uh, for different reasons, and I'll just talk about those a little bit. But one is Norway maple. Norway maple, there's many different varieties of Norway maple. There are green varieties, and there are purple or red uh, varieties. A lot of people will call this red maple, but it truly is not red maple. It's, it's a type of Norway maple with, with kind of purple red leaves. But Norway maple's becoming invasive in our woods. It's actually starting to spread outside of the urban community and uh, get into our native woods. And if you Google this, out east, um, on the east coast, it's actually becoming a pretty serious problem where it's actually out competing the native sugar maple. So it's, 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 it's an issue and it's a concern. Um, this gets me in trouble sometimes because I know this is a species that gets used a lot, but I've been doing this long enough that if I start, there was plants that I would see, a great example is burning bush euonymus. 19 years ago when I started in this area, I just started to see it show up in the woods. And I had a theory that if I stayed around long enough, I'd see a lot more 19 to 20 years later. Well, I have. So if I'm starting to see stuff in the woods now, eventually it's probably going to, that means it's starting to spread. And I'm starting to see this plant in the woods, okay? Now, I'm not telling everyone they have to cut their Norway maple down. I'm suggesting that maybe we need to start considering not planting this tree. Calorie pear, beautiful, beautiful tree, okay? Now, we used to plant Bradford pears and I, I have to admit, 
there's a gentleman named Dr. Jeff Isles at Iowa State University. If he was here today and I showed this picture right after, he'd show a picture from 14 years ago, me planting one of these. <laughs> okay? And now I'm telling you not to plant them. But that was 14 years ago. That was before we knew some of the things. Again, these things change. Um, but what's happened is the calorie pairs, and there's a lot of different varieties, but they're not supposed to be self-fertile, and they're not. But what's happened is the different cultivars are cross-pollinating, and they're producing a viable seed, and this is what's happening. They're taking over. This is in your own backyard. This is on the corner of Rochester and Scott Boulevard. It's beautiful in the spring, and it's beautiful in the fall. But in Illinois, Indiana, uh, parts of Kansas, it's coming through the road ditches. This stuff is spreading all over. It's very aggressive. And the birds are spreading it, and that seed is viable now on the new varieties or the new super hybrid. So it, it's a potential issue. Now, when I did this like 10 years ago, I warned about this tree. Now I'm telling you not to plant this tree. Um, and, and I haven't rec really recommended this tree for about 15, 20 years. But uh, my good friend, Dr. Isles, again, he and I fight over this one quite a bit. But the reason I suggest not, there's a real common couple different diseases, one called rhizosphere and one called stigmina, that can cause some real issues with this tree. And we know that our weather is changing, right? At least it has in the last five to 10 years. And I sat in um, on a weather talk yesterday, and we know our springs are getting weather, are wetter. Um, and we're getting more rain in shorter periods of time. Well, fungi love rain. They love humidity. And so over the last couple of years, we've, we've seen these problems get worse on these trees. And so what we usually see is, you got these beautiful blue spruce, but they start to decline from the bottom up. And it's usually from the inside out towards the tips, okay? And then they end up like this over time as it gets, you know, each spring. Now there are sprays, but you have to spray at least twice every spring for the rest of your life. And you have to coat the whole tree. And your timing is pretty critical of when you have to spray. And trees like this, you know, those are 30-foot trees. They, they probably cost, in, in the Iowa City area, if you, if you had someone spray it, $70 to $80 a tree. The first time, and they'll give you a break on the second spray, like 30 bucks a tree. Now, some people that have trees that aren't this bad yet have decided that I love this blue spruce. Grandma Lois planted it in 1950. That's my grandma. But... She planted it, and we want to keep this tree. So we'll do everything we can. So you could consider spraying. But even with spraying, sometimes they just continue to decline and get worse. Some people will prune the branches off just over time as they die up. But at some point, you just got to say, stop. <laughs> OK? All right. See, I can make you laugh a little bit. It's all happy. All right. So. Since you're laughing, I'll talk about another kind of concern. So I'm actually starting to tell people I would, now in forestry situations, we're still planting bur oak some. So if I do a planting of a couple acres, we plant six to 700 trees per acre. And I used to plant 100 to 150 bur oaks per acre in those mixes um, because bur oak was a great tree. It's a beautiful tree. It's great for wildlife habitat. It's, it, it can grow in a lot of varieties of soils and stuff, but I'm to the point now that if I'm planting three or four acres, I'll tell them to only plant 50 to 100 trees, bur oak, over the whole three or four acres. Because this disease, bur oak blight, um, was found out in western Iowa a number of years ago. It's called Tabaki Iowensis. It was actually identified by a professor at Iowa State. And it's most common on bur oaks. And the symptoms appear late July, August. But what happens is the leaves will brown and start to fall off. And it'll look a lot like oak wilt. But the thing that happens is you'll get 
trees that look like this one, that doesn't look good in August. That's not what a bur oak should look like. But if you come back, if this is the first year it was infected, if you come back to that tree next year, it'll leaf out and look just beautiful. And then come July and August again, it actually reinfects itself. And then every year it just keeps happening. And eventually what's happening out west, we're losing bur oak trees. Um, we're losing bur oak trees from this disease in Iowa City. I know of a couple uh, in town that I've watched over the last couple years that, that weren't treated or anything that eventually died. So this has a big impact, could have a big impact on things. It may be kind of hard to see in the back, but there's brown areas, okay, throughout this picture. This is in the Lus Hills. Those are all dead bur oaks, native dead bur oaks, mostly impacted by this disease. So our concerns, um, we've lost over 1,200 acres, mostly out west to, I wouldn't say all to this disease, but this disease has been heavily impacted. So we've probably salvaged harvest over 1,200 acres of bur oak just to try to salvage that material, okay? <laughs> Sanitation at this point does not appear to be a practical, because what happens is that fungus actually overwinters on dead leaves on the tree, on the petioles. And then in the spring, the spores just rain down on the new leaves as they come out. And that's how it kind of keeps reinfecting itself. There's no specific research at this point. They think there could be some natural tolerance or resistance, but there's been no specific research at this point. There are some fungicide treatments that do show some promise for individual trees. So if I have a big tree in my yard or on a golf course or in a park or something like that, they've had some success, variable success, but those treatments are expensive. It costs 10 to $14 per diameter inch to treat that tree, and you're probably gonna treat it every two to four years. So you basically treat it, and if it goes in remission, you wait till it starts showing symptoms again, and then you treat it again. But we're not gonna be able to do that in the woods, okay? So, just a few of the many choices to consider, and these are just trees that I've seen that I like, but again, just because I say I like them, I wouldn't plant them. You gotta find the plants that fit your needs and fit your situation. Um, we always say again, and I probably said it before, a list is only as good as it was when it was printed because you print it and then it's already outdated um, because things change. So there are many choices, do your research, okay? But I'll just show you a few examples. I, I always have to put an oak in. Now I showed this one earlier, that I called it a red oak, and it is a red oak, but the tree I'm talking about is chinkapin oak and it has a similar form, so I showed that and I knew I couldn't get by with this group using the same picture, so I had to tell you I was using the same picture. Because <laughs> somebody would have said, wasn't wait, that wait chinkapin oak a red oak mark in slide 54? So, but they have a form similar to that. They can, they can be somewhat upright, but they're gonna spread out over time. Chinkapin is a native. It, it actually does well in some of our rocky outcrop areas. There are actually some around Lake McBride, uh, around the, the lake, there that are actually native, um, but it's a big tree. Again, it's gonna need a big space. They'll get 50 to 70 feet tall, have a 30 to 40 foot spread, um, but their bark looks a lot like white oak, okay? Like I said, I was gonna throw in, there, there are some tolerant American elms, so we can start looking at that option. I would stay away from the hybrids because they're not true American elms. Um, and the reason I say that is I have some concern that if they, those produce seed, those could become invasive. So they're not gonna be uh, a native species. So there are some selections out there. But again, that doesn't mean you plant the whole thing to, to elms. I put this one in there because of Japanese beetle. The, the, we're, we usually don't, I mean, I love lindens, and when I did this 10, 12 years ago, I had American linden in one of my slides, but Japanese beetle loves it. But the one thing we're noticing about the Japanese beetle populations is they tend to go up and down. Um, 
Some years they eat them heavy, and some years they don't. But with this one, I do see them eat it, but most people are saying that these seem to be a little more tolerant. And there's a few of these in Iowa City. They're kind of nice. They, they have a dark green leaf on top and kind of a silvery underneath, so they have some aesthetics there. Lindens are great for pollinators. You see the beetles every, uh, every summer. They have a flower that comes a little later, but they're good for pollinators. And there are a number of tree species that are good for pollinators. So this may be one to consider, but this is a good medium to large size tree. This one gets planted a lot, but it's a good tree, honey locust, and, and especially if you, you know, you want to grow grass. If you want to grow grass, this allows some sunlight to get down to the grass. You know, personally, I would say get rid of the grass because I'm a tree person. Because it, it does cause a fatal disease if you have trees and grass, and some of you have heard this before. The fatal disease is called Homo sapiens sapien weed whackus killus. <laughs> and the common name is mower blight. So the more grass we can keep away from our trees, the better. And they'll grow better. There's a lot of research that shows if you mulch and keep that grass away from the trees, at least early on, they can do better. But some people don't like this either. It has these little leaflets that in the fall get sucked into your door and in the house, but not a bad shade tree, okay, in the right situations. Again, just an option, just something to consider. Very durable. These are in the ped mall. I don't know if they survived the construction or not. I know some did, but even though they survived the initial construction, we don't know if they'll survive long term. But these are just, we're just down the way here. Ginkgo. Um, ginkgo's great, but it's slow, 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 and slow. It just doesn't grow very fast. So as we know, we're not planting trees for ourselves in most cases. You're definitely not planting this one for you. You're planting it for someone else. But they're a neat tree. Um, once you learn that leaf, the other thing about these is they, uh, now the one thing they don't have a lot of benefits for pollinators. They don't have a lot of wildlife benefits, but they can provide shade. So they don't have a lot of ultimate benefits for other things, but it could be one tree in an array of trees. So it still could be an option. The one thing I like about it is it's, it's great that in the fall you get a really good frost, and most leaves fall in 24 hours. Just boom, they're gone. You rake them once, they're not like those oaks and different species that, you know, drop leaves until January. All right, Kentucky coffee tree. It's a native tree. Um, probably not a good street tree. If you have a, it's, it's a big tree, um, but it is a native. It does produce a fruit, but some, there's a cultivar, cultivar in there called espresso that doesn't produce seed pods. This one, though, if you're going to plant this, you have to deal with the ugly stick syndrome for 10 years. The ugly stick syndrome is you plant it, it looks like a dead stick. And for 10 years in the winter, it will look like a dead stick. And about year 11, it will start to get branches and look like a tree. So it'll get there. You just got to give it a little time. Um, but it definitely doesn't look good at first. But it has an interesting bark characteristic. But it has a leaf. This whole thing is one leaf. That leaf is that big. They're, they're pretty neat. They're native, but I don't see them a lot. I just see them kind of scattered along our river bottom edges and stuff. Not in the floodplain, so they're not a wet species, but they can tolerate a little bit of moist soil. London plane tree, but not sycamore. London plane is a cultivar that has some sycamore in it. Grows pretty fast, um, but is pretty tolerant to anthracnose, which we normally see on sycamores. So not a bad species to consider. But if you remember, when I showed the Asian longhorn beetle, it is actually on the list as a host of Asian long. That, that isn't, I wouldn't not plant it because of that, but I wouldn't plant large numbers. Um, but, it, but it can make a pretty nice big shade tree. Just a couple more, a few small ones. Service berry, I show this one every time I talk. There's a number of varieties of service berry has an edible fruit, nice fall color, has a spring flower. The thing you have to think about all these trees, has nice fall color, probably lasts a week or two. Has nice spring uh, flowers, only lasts a week or two. So again, 
think about these things and their location and how long they might provide different benefits and what those benefits. Um, you can get single stem types and a lot of times you can get multi-stem types too. I have to mention crab apple because Dr. Jeff Isles is a great friend of mine. Um, but if you're going to get crab apples, there's hundreds and hundreds of varieties of crab apples. But select ones that are scab tolerant or scab resistant. This last year, a lot of the crab apples had no leaves come about July 4 is because of apple scab. But if you looked around town, there were a lot of trees, a lot of crab apples with leaves because those were ones, some of the newer varieties have really good tolerance and really good resistance. And magnolia, I don't normally put this in there, but you know, you just have to deal with some years they'll bloom and some years the blooms will freeze. But as a tree, there's saucer magnolia, there's star magnolia, there's luminar magnolia, there's all kinds of different magnolias. Um, and I think there's evidence that our weather is changing because this last couple years, a number of the magnolias in town were blooming in September. They're trying to figure out what's going on. So something's going on, right? We don't know what it is. But I think magnolia is, is one to consider. And then this is kind of one that uh, is a native woodland plant, but it's somebody's smiling back there, so maybe she's planted it or something. But this is hornbeam or musclewood. This is a native, and, and the bark looks like kind of a, a mussel, very fine-tuned silver. But it's, it's probably a tree that only gets 20 to 30 feet tall, not a very big tree. We'll have some shade tolerance. So if you had some bigger trees and wanted something within those trees to start coming up amongst, that, that may be an option. What's the Latin? Um, Carpinus Carolina. Carpinus. Yes, yes. Is that at the university? Yes, yes, yes. So um, there is a program in Iowa City, and there's flyers over. Beth was nice enough to print some off. But the Iowa DNR does a residential tree program uh, with the uh, Iowa State Extension folks, and they have 250 trees available this spring for $30 a piece. You can buy two trees per resident as long as you're in the Johnson County general area. There's a whole list of species, and there was 250, and they've sold 100. So there's 150 left. It's first come, first serve. You order them up, and then there's a date on there. Uh, it's this spring. Then you would pick them up on that day. Um, but you pay for them ahead of time, and then you pick them up that day. But that's over there. And a number of the species I talked about are on there, and there's a, a bunch of others too. But there is a program. And these are good-sized shade trees. These aren't little seedlings from our state forest nursery. These are actually... Um, we bid out, and uh, local nurseries bid on them, or nurseries in Iowa bid on them, and then we get them, um, and then we sell them. And this will be the last year for this because the funding went away. This was tied to utility funding and utilities, and they changed the rules, and they no longer have to use that for these kind of programs, so this program got eliminated. So we've got one more year left. So the sun will set tonight, and I know some of this was depressing, uh, it, it is, but diversity, diversity, diversity. I, I think, I truly, truly believe that's our only defense. And, and, and I truly believe that uh, the sun will come up tomorrow. Thank you very much. We're going to start again now with uh, questions and such, but we have an announcement or two. We just have a little reminder that uh, we're. Thank you. We just have a little reminder that uh, the public library and the master gardeners will have a seed share 3.0 uh, coming up in a couple of Sundays. There's a poster over there on the wall. And also, if you have gardening questions, don't hesitate to call the Hort line um, and get those questions answered. I don't have the phone number off the top of my head. I should have that, but you can easily access it. So thank you very much. And now for more thank questions. You. Thank you, Linda. 
And again, there are uh, some handouts over there if you haven't availed yourself of them. Um, and we've got some questions here uh, from our audience. And I'll just probably go through them in order. Um, this person has a one-year oak tree that has had bark, some bark removed by a deer. Will it survive? Yes, it will. Um, but how well it will will depend on how much of the bark is removed. I, I would say if there's only 10 to 20 percent, um, maybe even up to 30 percent. I mean, a one-year-old probably doesn't have much. But if there's over half, I would still give it a chance. I would put some type of protection around it so the deer can't come back again. And the thing I would look for this spring is what we call callus tissue or wound wood. On the edges of where it was stripped, you'll start to see the bark which is actually wound wood, come and try to close that. You don't want to put any kind of wound dressing or tar or paint or anything on it. You just want that tree to try to seal itself. And the thing to remember is trees do not heal, they seal. So when you cut a branch off, a live branch off a tree, where that branch is cut, is it's actually dead. That's where, we, that's where knots come from. So what a tree does chemically, it makes barriers on the inside and then it seals on the outside and closes that wound and seals that decay in the tree and keeps it from spreading. So in that case, I just wouldn't put anything on it. I would protect it so it doesn't. But if over half of it's gone, um, I might think about starting over. Or another option would be is let it go this summer. If it leaves out pretty good, but it looks like there's a lot of damage, let it grow. And then next winter, cut it off at the ground. In the next spring, it will sprout. It will sucker and then develop a tree from that if you don't want to dig and start over. Because if, that, if, that, if it's grown enough to give that root good growth, it, it can sprout from there and you could develop a new tree that way. But cut it low to the ground so it sprouts. OK, next. OK. Um. Does the University of Iowa do a good job of diversity of trees on campus? In 10 words or less. <laughs> yes, yes, no. yes, 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 good. yes, yes, and yes. OK, great. Um, they, they do. Uh, uh, Andy Dahl is one of their folks, and he plants everything under the sun. Uh, and they're really trying, to, ever since he's been there, he's been there quite a long time. You know, they, they had, I think, somewhere around 500 ash trees, but they had a lot of other things. And, and I know they have, they did have their inventory online at one point, so a person could see, but it, you just walk across campus, and, and there's a lot of, there's English oak, there's Dawn Redwood, there's, there's a lot of kind of unique plants. We kind of have our own arboretum right here, and I think they've tried to kind of set up a system where you can actually visit that now, so yes. Mark, this is my own question. That tree on, on the front of campus, in the front of the Pentecrest, excuse me, um, the one that has that low branch. That's, Actually, I think that's the large I showed that was kind of crooked. It's, it's the one that has that really low uh, bush that everybody, or branch and they have, that everybody rocks on. During all the things now, they have a sign that yeah. says, please don't hurt our tree. Yeah. Yes. Yes. What kind of tree is that? It's a larch. Okay. That, that actually was the tree that I showed that was crooked. Oh, okay. That was that tree. Oh, okay. I yeah. didn't notice that. Yeah, that is okay. a cool tree. Yes. So that is a deciduous conifer. And that's when I get calls on quite a bit. So it looks like an evergreen. And often people will move into a new house and think that they have a pine tree or an evergreen. And in the fall, it turns yellow and all the needles fall off. So they call and say that their pine tree is dying. But usually we can give them good news that it's supposed to do that. Okay. But yeah, that's Great. large. Um, speaking of conifers, what conifers do you recommend? Specimen or windbreak? Specimen okay. or um, windbreak, maybe? It, it's, a tough, it's a tough list. Um, there's a lot of varieties of dwarf conifers. I was at a, a thing in Muscatine yesterday, and there's a lot of small varieties of a lot of different species that I think work really well if you want smaller stuff. But for the bigger stuff, that needle cast is a real bad thing for the spruce trees. Like the blue spruce, I see that those disease problems a lot, but I also see it on white spruce and black hill spruce. So the one spruce that doesn't seem to show as many problems is Norway, 
does fairly decent in this region. Likes moist, well-drained. Uh, the other one I really like and have always liked, and it's sometimes, most time does very well, but situations that may have trouble, I love white pine. Very fast growing. It's deer candy, I know it. But you get it up and get it going, um, that tree will go two to three feet a year. And the only thing about them is they kind of have these catcher mitt branches. So as they get older, they don't keep that pyramidal shape, uh, shape, but they look like a very large Japanese garden pine when they're 60 feet tall because they're missing a little branch here, a little branch there, which I drive 1,200 miles a month in my district. And um, I like to identify trees two miles away at 55 miles an hour. And that's one that I can identify very well. Cool. So white pine. Um, Norway spruce, and for windbreaks, it's going to get me in trouble, but I love eastern red cedar. It's a great windbreak tree. Doesn't have a lot of issues, a lot of problems. I'd like to be able to start using Serbian spruce, but I'm not sure if it's going to have problems with the, with the needle fungi. Um, another one I really like is concolor fir, but I see it do well in some cases and not so well in others. I actually see con color fir do better as you go out into western Iowa where it's a little drier. As I come this way, I see a lot more, just not as uniform. Um, so that's a few of them. But there's, I know there's a number of these more exotic ones and stuff, and most of those. Another one I actually like is bald cypress. If you have kind of a wet area and stuff like that, or a, a draw down the bottom, um, Terry Robinson, who was the city forester of Iowa City, really thought ahead after the 93 flood, he planted some 20 feet from the bank down in Lower City Park. Do you know what happened to those trees? The bank eroded 20 feet, and it actually took them out. But he, he was thinking ahead. He went 20 feet from the bank, and it's still, but they're, they're one that can tolerate wet conditions. Down south, they actually produce knees out of the water and stuff, and I used to say I never saw knees in Iowa, but I have seen knees in Iowa. Um, I saw a planting down in Muscatine, it was a really wet area, and it was starting to get dark, and it got real wobbly, and I looked down, and there was knees coming up all out of the ground. And knees, basically, are the root system comes out of the ground. So you'd want them in an area that if they did produce knees, you could stop mowing. But it would take a long time for them to produce knees. So there's, there's a few. Okay, thank you. Uh, with discussion of climate change and planting diversity, some are suggesting... Um, lower zone five and upper zone six uh, trees for diversity. Is this premature with a winter like this year? I was at a talk yesterday and the gentleman, his name is Ray Wolf, and I think he works for the, um, the weather service or someone like that. And he basically said, looking at all the prediction models, six will be here, could be here sooner than we think. Yeah, it's coming. He said, yeah. most, we're basically, I mean, just north of us was four, and five has expanded. Creeps. And so um, the thing you got to remember, though, it's not all temperatures. So there's a lot of different things, and that's where I still think the diversity, I, I, I don't know, um, you know, I, I probably wouldn't plant um, southern pine from Florida yet or anything like that. <laughs> But some of those plants may be on the edge here, um, flowering dogwood that's kind of on the edge, but I know places in Muscatine, I've even seen flowering dogwood up on the Grinnell campus in a protected area actually blossom, mm -hmm. do well. Um, I would probably plant our native pagoda first, uh, but I think eventually we're gonna maybe start seeing some plants that, that we can plant. But it's, again, it's, it's the thing that he came across is even though the average temperature can change. You can still have some really cold winters when the weather changes. So even if those plants are not adaptable to those really cold conditions, they're still going to die. OK. OK. Thank you. Um, when is the best time to prune a magnolia tree with dead branches and hollow branches? How often would you prune a neglected magnolia? OK. So um, I would say. Uh, a crab apple, a magnolia, any tree with dead branches, you could prune any time of the year if you're pruning dead branches. Um, 
With oaks, because of oak wilt, you only want to prune those in the winter time. And I usually say November through March 1st. But because this winter has been, people have been calling me and I said, maybe till next Wednesday, because it's supposed to be 58 <laughs> next Wednesday. So I think you could go a few more days. And that's being really conservative with, with oaks. But I would say any tree, the, the thing is, when you plant a tree, um, I don't think you want to do a lot of pruning in the first couple years. In the first couple years, I would focus on dead branches or really weak angle branches, depending on the species and the variety. But the thing you got to remember is a tree needs branches, and that's how it feeds itself, through those branches and leaves. So we don't want to cut too many at any time, the more we can leave on. So any tree with dead branches, I would say you could prune those any time, except an oak, even an oak with dead branches, I'd prune those dead branches in the winter time. So I'm not nicking live branches and stuff. But with the magnolia, I mean, even, you know, you could go out today before it got dark if you wanted to and prune those off. Or in that situation, sometimes it may be easier once it leaves out to be able to see where all those dead branches are and then go after it. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, number... Let me add one more thing. Sorry. Oh, sure. Go ahead. The two times I don't want you to prune a tree is in the spring when they're leafing out and in the fall when they're starting to drop their leaves or going under fall color in general. Okay. okay. Um, this is walnuts. Uh, number of walnuts in neighboring yards. Are they going to cause trouble for new trees? They do seem to create issues with shrubs, hemlocks, sweet, something. So wal walnuts produce a chemical called jugalone. And it's a natural herbicide produced by that tree. And, and there are some plants that don't like it. Tomatoes hate walnuts. If you've ever had tomatoes near uh, walnut trees, they don't like them. There's a decent publication from Purdue University. And if you Google walnut toxicity, University of Purdue, it'll give you an observational list of species that they have observed. There's really, I don't think, been any great research out there done but they'll give you observations of plants that seem somewhat susceptible to that chemical. So that chemical is actually produced in the roots, it's produced in the bark, it's produced in the leaves, and it's produced in the hulls. So it's basically in the soil. Um, but as a forester, we've, I've done plantings for 19 years in this region, and I mix white pine, spruce, oaks, hickories, and walnuts all together, and they like each other. They grow. And, and I don't see a lot of issues with the walnut that way. But I know there, especially some of the flowering plants or the perennials, there are some that they'll be on the list that are more susceptible to that chemical than others. Okay. Uh, can you talk about yellow wood for a domestic garden, yay or nay? Um, yellow wood is, um, has a compound leaf, yellow fall color. It's not a huge tree, but it's one that more people are starting to try to plant. Um, I think it can be a kind of an accent. You have to remember, I'm a forester, not a landscaper. Um, I'm not Chuck Porto. I was with him yesterday. <laughs> so uh, I have a little more hair. We were joking. We were on a committee yesterday, and the guy that put us up said, I'm going to go from hairless to a little, a little more, and then the other two guys had a lot of hair. Um, but uh, I, I think it's one to consider. Uh, it, I, I, I want to say it's... Uh, 40 to 60 foot tree. I think they can get fairly decent size, but there's a really nice one um, on campus up at Iowa State that I learned to identify when I was in college, and it's still there, and it's kind of a unique, unique tree. Okay. Um, any disease problems with hickory trees? So the question, any disease problems with hickory trees? Um, there, is a, there is a wilt disease similar to oak wilt, that they think could be out there, and there's a couple beetles. Um, I wouldn't say there's major, major problems, but we, when I first started here, we, we did a study on bitternut hickory in Iowa because we were getting some decline, and they were finding the, a fungus and some beetles. Um, I wouldn't say it's bad as problems like oak wilt, but there are some things that have been impacting them a little bit. He, here's the thing. Everything has a problem. Mm -hmm. Everything has a problem. Everything has a problem. But 95% of the problems aren't a problem. There's only about 5% of these that are problems, but 
some of the problems are big problems. So it can wipe out those things. But when I look at people's yards, if people bring samples to the extension office and stuff, there's little bumps that show up on leaves and branches and all those things. Most of those are not a problem. So there's a lot of, I can walk in any place and say, well, this is an insect or this is a disease, but a lot of those aren't a problem. But it's these, you know, small percent that can be an issue. That's encouraging. <laughs> I'm trying to stay positive. Yes, very positive. That's good. Um, if you have an established ash tree, how many feet away would you need to be able to tr uh, would you need to be to be able to plant another tree to eventually replace the ash? Are you treating the ash tree? Yes. Okay. If you're treating the ash tree, I would say I'd want to be um, probably 25 feet away, 20 to 25 feet, depending on how big the tree. You know, if, if it's a medium age ash tree that could live another 20, 30 years. Think about the, the next tree getting big and that tree getting big, and, but I'd probably say 25 feet or so. Yep. And what are the threats to white oaks? <sighs> Is that so the 5%? I, I took that out of my presentation. Oh. Because I was trying not to be negative. I was trying to be positive. So I'll tell you a quick story. So in 2011, in northern Missouri, they started getting large pockets of declining white oak in their woodlands. But there, there was a pattern. It was down along ravines and different areas. So they tied it to weather and some other issues. But they did some research. At the same time, in southern Iowa, people were saying that we were starting to see some decline in problems with white oak. And um, in 2014, the foresters from Amana called me and said, Mark, hey, we've got this pocket. And the Amanas own 10,000 acres of woodlands. And 75% of that is oak. It's a lot of oak, a lot of white oak, a lot of upland. And they've been doing really good management. I mean, if anyone's doing good management, they're harvesting and stuff. But they're replanting, they're reestablishing, they're doing forest stand improvement, they're doing all the right things. Um, but they called and said, we have this pocket of, of dead oak. So I went and looked at it. And we had a couple wet springs before and stuff, and it was down in a low pocket. And we kind of looked at it and said, well, you know, we've had some different conditions. These trees kind of turned yellow and then eventually just kind of died. So. We said well, it was probably weather. Well, every year it kind of creeped up the hill. And now, um, in the last three years, they haven't hardly harvested any live white oak because they're too busy salvaging dead white oaks. They're cutting a lot of dead white oaks. And I have been, this is one I really have a lot of bad dreams about. Um, I do have some good dreams, I promise. Uh, but, uh, we haven't been able to figure out what it is. We've, I've brought in the Forest Service. I've brought in our Forest Health Specialist. But we actually took uh, Amana's agriculture drone, their pictures that they took in 2014, and we watched those trees die. They were green from the, the pictures, and then over a couple years, those zones started to turn yellow, and then they turned red. So we could see the stress in the pictures from the photosynthetic ability of those plants. And what he does, he goes out and looks at trees and they look a little off. They'll start to turn kind of thin and stuff. He'll put a mark on them. And almost every tree that he marks dies within two years of that mark. And there's nothing in the paint. Um, so I have some concerns about white oak. And that's why I actually didn't put it on my list of trees to plant. I'm not saying don't plant it, because here's the funny thing. We're seeing it in mature stands of th these oak trees are 100, 150 plus, okay? Some 200. But I have plantations that I work with across my district, and not a single white oak looks bad. And they're 15 to 20 to 30 years old. They look healthy, they look good. But it's these mature stands, so I don't know if something is predisposing them that the younger trees aren't, um, that can fight off and the bigger trees can't. So. Story will continue. Okay. Sorry for that one. No, no problem. Uh, what about planting pecan trees in this area? And if you did, do you have to have two? 
no. in order to produce the one, plant? One will produce. There's one on, actually, there's one on the, uh, on the fairgrounds. It's, uh, it's not the native, but it's one of the horticulture varieties, but it produces every year. And, but we do have northern pecan that, that, does, that is native to Iowa, native mostly to southern, but it does come up this way. And actually, the core has found it clear up on the Mississippi, up to Bellevue, I think, native. Um, but that nut is much smaller than your, your horticulture varieties. But yeah, it'll grow. I, I've actually planted it in projects up near um, Central City. And it's done, we're actually starting to get some. He planted these in 2005, and some of those are already 15 to 20 feet tall. Yeah. OK. Um, there are a couple that I'm not positive I'm reading these correctly. Um, I think this asks, may red cedar be planted near a 40-year-old spruce now with the blight? Um, Was that the question? Yes. No. A spruce. So, a if, cedar if the question was, can a can a cedar be next to a blue spruce? The cedars don't get the same fungus that the spruce do. Okay. They could have some different problems, but they they don't they don't get the same needle cast that the uh, spruce. So, I would say if you were going to replace a blue spruce with um, cedar nearby, you could do that. Okay, just a couple more. Okay. Um, in our cold winter, or is our cold winter going to adversely affect any particular trees? It, it could. Um, it, again, if you have the gentleman I was with, Ray Wolf, yesterday, he is doing an experiment with zone six um, red butts. And he's had them for four years now. But he looked at me yesterday and he goes, this will be the test this year, Mark. So. I would say if you have plants that are pushing that zone hardiness, you may see some dieback or some killback on some of those trees with this kind of winter. And I know a couple winters ago, um, I, I grew up in Iowa City. This, this wasn't that a normal winter from way back, was it? I, growing up as a kid, I mean, I remember it being pretty cold and snowy because I used to shovel. We didn't have a snowblower at that point um, with my dad when he was plowing. But um, I would say if you have plants that are questionable, but a couple years ago when we had some cold winters, I did see some red buds that did get some winter die back and a few other plants that maybe normally wouldn't be on the, or would be on the edge. So we may see something from that, yeah. But they'll probably survive? They just don't have die back or? Um, it really they, depends. Okay. I mean, it'll, it'll vary on the age, the size, the location, and stuff like that. I mean, there could be some plants that may actually okay. die. Okay. Hopefully, and, it'll just be die back. Okay. Um, so this, I saved this for the last one. Uh -oh. uh, do you make home visits to help residents determine the best <laughs> tree up options Great for their question. landscape and location? So I'm a district forester, <laughs> and... Um, Really, my focus is on forest lands and, and acreages that um, maybe you're planting windbreaks and stuff like that. I, I'm backlogged sometime in April right now. And it's really hard for me to do individual service calls in people's yards. But with that said, um, if you uh, want to email me, send me pictures, call me. I'm always willing to talk or bring samples and pictures into the county extension office. I'd be more than welcome to help you. The other thing is, if you live in the Iowa City area, I, I do have a habit to ride my bike. And I do have a habit to stop by people's house on the way home sometimes, or on the way to work. Uh, if cookies are at the door, that tends to help. <laughs> I said this 10 years ago, too, I think. Same yeah. thing. I think yeah. I even said cookies. Yeah. Um, but it's really hard for me to do that, but I will try to help you within my, how I can within my system. Um, but I get hundreds and hundreds of emails every year and calls, and I actually, believe it or not, I can text now. I'm 52 years old, <laughs> and I text for the first time 12 weeks ago. My kids were so proud of yeah. me. So, I can accept your text, and I can accept pictures, 
and stuff like that. I even learned how to take pictures and send them to people. Wow. My kids were just like, wow, Dad, you're doing so good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but my personal phone is a track phone, so I buy that at Walmart. So that's my work phone I can, I can do. But you can send me stuff, and I will try to help you any way I can. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.